uh, a good little chunk here from verses 17 through 34. First Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 17. So this is Paul now speaking to the church in Corinth. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. So then, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we have more, dis- uh, sorry, but if we were more discerning with regard to ourselves, we would not come under such judgment. Nevertheless, when we are judged in this way by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be finally condemned with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Those who are hungry should eat something at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give further directions. May God bless the reading of his word. I don't know if your parents did what my parents did, uh, but when I was a kid, it seemed to me that whenever we as a family were going to eat at another person's house, my parents would sit all us kids down and we'd go over table manners. Uh, and, And so we got the long list of the ways we are supposed to be good guests at another person's table. We were told that you're supposed to wash your hands before you eat. Now, we never did this stuff at home, right? But this is the sort of stuff we were supposed to do when, when we went to someone else's house and ate their food at their table. Uh, wash your hands, eat everything that's put in front of your plate, whether you like it or not. And if you didn't like it, lie and say that you liked it. Uh, don't leave the table until you're given permission. Uh, chew with your mouth closed, don't put your elbows on the table, and on and on it goes. This is how we were supposed to eat when we went over and were the guest at another person's house because we all want to be good guests, worthy guests. We all want to honor our hosts. Uh, and sometimes we go to great length not to cause offense. I remember uh, being in, in Mongolia I don't know if I've ever shared this from the pulpit, this story. I was a 15-year-old uh, in, in, in the grasslands of Mongolia, found ourselves in, I guess what you'd call a yurt, you know, what the nomads live in. And hospitality is huge in Mongolia. Number one virtue, hospitality, like it is in most places in the world. Uh, and, and as an honored guest, as the white guy, right, there, uh, th- they, they brought out their best stuff for us which meant fermented horse milk and sheep fat. 
And I remember them having this big, apparently, I don't know if any of our sheep farmers here, apparently on, on, on the butt of a sheep, there's a huge chunk of fat. Like it's just fat. And this is apparently the prime cut. And so that big hunk of fat is sitting on the table in the middle of the gear, and it's cold. It's not hot fat, it's cold fat. And he just takes a knife and he cuts off a hunk of fat like this and he gives it to me. What an honor. And I'm sitting there gnawing on this thing going, this is the worst thing I've ever eaten in my life. Don't throw up, Rusty. Don't throw up. Don't throw up. Don't. And I just could not, I couldn't do it. I, I knew I couldn't do it. So, so when, he, <laughs> when the guy left the tent to go do something, I, I threw it under the couch. All right? I, <laughs> I, I threw it under the couch where it wouldn't be found at least until I was out of town. And then I... I told them how delicious it was. Thank you for the sheep fat. And um, Now, if you would be that conscientious about how you eat at the Johnson's table, how conscientious should you be when you, be when you eat at the Lord's table? Which is what this text here is all about. We call this the Lord's table. I move this here not because we're having communion this week, we're eating the Lord's Supper together next Sunday. Um, but I wanted this before us. This is what we call the Lord's table. Next Sunday, like every first Sunday of the month, on that table are going to be pieces of bread that are cut from one loaf. Little glasses full of grape juice. And you know how this goes. The juice and the bread are passed out and, and we say some words at the table. We, we recall the words of Jesus and then we eat together and we drink together. And that's what we do the first Sunday of um, every month. We eat the Lord's supper, supper around the Lord's table. And so it's something we do all the time. And I realize that in, in my eight years here, I don't think I've ever preached on what this means, what this is all about how to do this and how not to do this. And so as we're going through this sermon series called You Asked For It, where you've been able just to submit the questions that have been on your mind, um, this was one, one of the questions that was submitted. How do I eat the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner? Because if you were listening to those words that I just read of Paul's here from 1 Corinthians 11, he warns them not to eat and to drink the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. And if you do, that, th there can be some, some consequences if you eat and drink in an unworthy manner. So the question is, okay, how do I eat and how do I drink in a worthy manner? What does that look like? We want to be good guests around the Lord's table. So I think that that's a good question that needs to be addressed. I don't want to just assume that, that we, all, we all really understand what we're doing here and that, that we're doing it right because I, I, I know some of you have aren't like myself or many of us growing up just doing this from as far back as we remember. Some of you have come from no church. Some of you have come from other churches, the Catholic church, where it maybe looks differently and has a bit of a different meaning than how we understand it. And so I realized, you know, this is something we're doing every month. And, and I wonder how many of you are, are doing this, but with maybe little understanding to what it is we're actually doing and how to do it properly in a worthy manner. So, so it's, it's a good question. Some of us maybe have never been taught the, the how and the why. And, and there's some things we do, and we, we do habitually without really understanding the reason. I heard a story of a little girl who asked her mother, Mommy, why do you cut the ends of the meat off before you cook it? Um, the mother told her that she thought it added flavor and allowed the meat to absorb the spices, but perhaps she should ask her grandmother since her, her grandmother always did it that way. So the little girl went to her grandmother and asked, Grandma, uh, why do you and mommy cut the ends of the meat off before you cook it? Her mother thought for a moment, and, or grandmother thought, and, and said, well, I think it allows the meat to stay tender because it soaks up the juices better, but why don't you ask your nana? After all, I learned from her, and, and she's always done it that way, so the little girl found uh, her, her nana and climbed up into her great-grandmother's lap and asked nana, why do you cut the ends off of the meat before you cook it? Nana answered, I had to. The pot wasn't big enough. Like that. <laughs> And you've heard little stories like that, right? Where something happens 
and then we just do it that way, we might not even be understanding why we do it that way, and sometimes we just get it all wrong. It's never been explained. And I think we do that sometimes in life, and sometimes we seldom stop to ask why. We develop habits and traditions, and if you're not careful, you, you just forget why you do certain things. Uh, and we don't want to do that. Some of us have been doing this for a long time, and, and maybe, maybe if, if you asked us, what does this mean, we could give you a, a, a pretty good answer. But you know, it's so easy to do this thoughtlessly and mindlessly, isn't it? When, when, when we come together, uh, to, to eat and drink the Lord's Supper together, we can do it in a way that we're just in automatic mode, right? We're not engaging our hearts. We're not engaging our minds. We're not even really thinking what it's, what it's all about. And, and you know what? There's no honor for God in that, is there? So many of the things we do, like spiritual things, and, and, and we just, we're not actually engaged in them. When I, when I put my daughters to bed and we have this prayer you know i can just ramble off that prayer word for word amen and i can do that night after night and not think of god at all realize i'm not even speaking to god i'm just going through the motions here we can do that when when we pray around the table when we say grace right um and that's just not honoring to god uh, it's superficial because it's done without thought. And we don't want to do the Lord's Supper or any spiritual activity in that way because quite simply it just doesn't honor God. There's another reason that it, it's a good question, the question, how do I eat the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner? Uh, again, because Paul says, listen, you can eat it in such a way that you are sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. There's such a way to, to, to do this that, that Paul says is sin. And, and, and sin that maybe even will bring some severe punishment. So, I remember as a kid, I don't know what your experience was, but, but how my parents explained this um, I was kind of scared of doing something wrong here. Because this was always said, make sure you don't do this in an unworthy manner. Examine yourselves, examine yourselves, and make sure you take it properly. Or, you know, as it says, there can be judgment here. And so I had that kind of fear as a kid at the table. And there were, there were Sundays where I saw my mom not eat it. She passed it by. And I wondered, why is my mom passing it by? Why is my mom not eating and so I heard this warning again and again. And, it, and it's something we have to take seriously because Paul says here in verses um, 29 and 30, he says this. And this is, this is kind of astounding. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. That is why many among you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. You know what fallen asleep means? They died. So what he's saying is some of you, because of the way you've done this and the attitude you've brought to this, some of you have actually gotten sick and God has actually killed some of you. Isn't that astounding? I was talking about this with my wife this morning and, and about this whole idea of, wow, this is serious stuff because there's a judgment that, comes, that can come if we really do this in an in unworthy manner. And, and I talked about the, the seriousness of it because God says, or Paul says that God has killed people. Remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira coming and lying to the church and them dropping dead, Right? Little, poor little Pippa, she, she was eating her, which she calls mermel, her oatmeal, at the table. She's overhearing this conversation, and, and I said about God killing, and she, with this exasperated look, God kills? Like, that's, what? No, God doesn't kill. God loves. God kills? I thought, oh, no, okay, this is, this is, this is, how do I explain this to a three-year-old? No, God loves. Jesus died for you. But he says, 
And, and Paul doesn't want them to misunderstand here. He says, listen, um, when we are judged in this way, if God even kills somebody because of the way they do this, he says, we are being disciplined so that we will not finally be condemned with the world. So he's saying not that he's sending somebody to hell, but he's saying, listen, I see where this is going. And as mercy, I'm going to have to end this right here because if this keeps going in this direction, it could, lend to the, it could end with the condemnation the world will receive, e- eternal condemnation. That's a pretty astounding statement. God can take a life in order to save people from hell. I think all of that should suggest, wow, this is serious, right? Let's not, let's not do this in a superficial way. Let's take serious what is obviously serious to God here. Um, so I want to just take a few minutes here to, to answer the question, what is the Lord's Supper and how do we take it in a worthy manner. We believe here as, as uh, a church that Jesus Christ commanded his church to observe two what we call ordinances. It's kind of a fancy theological word uh, which comes from the word ordained. There are two things that Jesus Christ ordained or established for his church to practice, to observe. The first one we saw last Sunday, a baptism. Baptism, something commanded, given by Jesus, which signifies um, a person's faith in Christ, signifies the beginning of a new life, and that just happens once. And the second uh, uh, practice that Jesus ordained that we observed is that we observe is the Lord's Supper, which Jesus instituted at that last supper. Now, all four Gospels record this last meal that Jesus had with his disciples around the table before he was to go uh, to the cross and and all all four gospels record that conversation around there and we're told that as they were eating that supper together in that place jesus took some of the bread and he said guys this is my body they had no idea what he was talking about at that time this is my body which is broken for you when you do this eat in remembrance of me And then he took the cup, you know, and then that bread went around. They shared the bread and he took the cup. He said, this blood is the blood of the covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. When you drink this, drink in in remembrance of me. Um, That meal that they were eating there was the Passover meal. It was a really important meal. And if you want to understand what, what Jesus was talking about and what this means, you have to understand a little bit about what that meal was. God had commanded the Jews every year at a certain time on the calendar to observe what was called the Passover meal where they were to recall, be reminded of, and to celebrate how God had delivered his people from slavery in Egypt. You find that story back in Exodus chapter 12 when the people of Israel were slaves in Egypt and and God was delivering them and how he delivered them is is he commanded them to take a lamb and he said you 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 kill that lamb you take the blood of that lamb and you put that blood on the doorpost of your house you stay in that house you take that lamb you prepare that lamb you eat this meal and watch for the lord's deliverance and that night the lord delivered his people and, and 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 they were led out of slavery in Egypt and they crossed the Red Sea and eventually found, they found themselves in the promised land. So this yearly eating of that meal served to remind them of the deliverance of God and to celebrate what God had done. And so when Jesus was at that meal where they were thinking of that and celebrating that, Jesus t- says, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed for you and in other words he was um he was saying this represents a greater deliverance than deliverance from slavery in egypt i am delivering you in my body and in my blood i am delivering you from sin and from death the disciples didn't understand that at the time but 
in, in, in a few hours, they would understand what Jesus was saying. In my body and in my blood, I am delivering you from sin and from death. And I'm going to make peace. I'm going to make peace once for all between you and God. And so in 1 Peter 1 verses 18 and 19, it says, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ. A lamb without blemish or defect. Jesus is that perfect Passover lamb. Sacrifice for the deliverance of us. The precious blood of Jesus. Is Jesus' blood precious? Any amens? Other than Julia? (laughs) Jesus' blood blood is, is precious. It redeems us when we put our trust in it. And that's all Jesus had to say about it. Okay, here's some bread. Eat this and remember. Here's a cup. Drink and remember. And that's it. That's the only instruction Jesus gives. And we have all these questions. Denominations have been split as to how to do this. All the little rules during the service, before the service, one bread that we rip chunks off of, little cups, wafers, gluten, not gluten, believer, unbeliever. We want to know all the rules of the table and, and And all Jesus said was, when you come together, eat and remember, drink and remember. And that's all he left us with. And and, and the early church started to to, to practice that. We're told in Acts chapter 2, in those first days of the church after, after the Holy Spirit had come down on them, every day those Christians were gathering in the synagogue. Of course, they were all Jews at that point. Every day they were gathering in the synagogue and they were doing four things. They were they were being taught. The apostles' teaching, they were fellowshipping, they were praying, and they were breaking bread together. When those first believers of Jesus came to get t- together, they would eat together. They would break bread and remember, in fulfillment of the command of Jesus, remember his body and his blood sh- broken and shed for them and what that meant. And so it seems that that happened on the f- every day, you know, If you come from a Catholic church, this is something you do every time the Catholics get together, right? My dad grew up in a church where they did this like three or four times a year. We happen to do it the first Sunday of every month. Is there a right or a wrong way? It it seems that whenever they got together at the beginning, at the very beginning, they, they did it when they got together every day, but by Acts chapter 20, it says that on the first day of the week when they gathered together, they broke bread Knit together. So at some point on Sundays when they gathered to worship, um, they would have this, this special meal called the Lord's Supper together. In fact, uh, there's this quote recorded from, from a Roman governor named Pliny, Pliny the Younger, writing to Emperor Trajan. It was a letter written around 100 AD uh, in which uh, he reported that the Christians, in this letter, these Christians would meet on a stated day in the early morning to address a form of prayer to Christ as to a divinity. Later in the day, these same Christians would reassemble and they would eat in common a harmless meal. So it seemed that, that when they would gather together on that first day of the week, when they, when they would gather and worship, they would, they would, they would take, they would, Uh, They would take bread, they would break bread and observe the Lord's Supper in in, in a symbolic fashion. In the book of Jude, it's called a love feast. So there's not a whole lot of instruction about the table, but the picture you get is that when the Christians came together, there was a meal, they would eat together, and at some point, uh, probably at the end of that meal, it culminated in this act, which involved bread in which it involved wine. And they would share that bread and wine and, it, and, it, and, it, and, and they would remember the body and the blood of Jesus together as one church. And that's what's happening here in 1 Corinthians 11, right? They're coming together and they're having a meal together and they're observing the Lord's Supper 
or so they thought they were. One chapter earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, um, verses 16 and 17, it says, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? He's talking about the Lord's Supper. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake in one loaf. That's an important verse. So it seemed when they came together at some point in that meal, and listen, one loaf of bread ain't going to fill a whole church. So there was other food they were eating. But at one point, the culmination of that meal is that there was one loaf of bread that came. And they each took a piece of that one bread together. And he says, there is one loaf because there is one body. There is one people of God. This is why there is one loaf. And so that, that, that idea of oneness is key here because the, the, the Lord's Supper was an act that declared and fostered Christian unity. In Jesus Christ, in his body, we are one people. We are united together by being united with Jesus. In fact, that's one of the reasons Jesus died. I mean, there's a whole lot of reasons the New Testament gives us why Jesus died, what he accomplished for us. Listen to what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself, Jesus, is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. What hostility is he talking about? Between people, between groups, where there was animosity. In Jesus' death, he has tore down the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose, what was the purpose of Jesus and the cross? His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two. Speaking about Jews and Gentiles, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who are near for through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Do you see what he's saying? Jesus came and died. One of the reasons he did that was to take care of your hostility and make you one people of God united together through Jesus. Galatians chapter three. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. He's talking to the church. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. All these distinctions in the world, Jesus has done away with all, all, that, all that divides people, that hostility between groups. And in Jesus, by believing in Jesus, he's making one new united people. And that's what they were saying when they came together in aid of one loaf. Jesus makes us one. Jesus died, yes, to forgive us of our sins, but to make one new humanity united together in him. So that brings us to the question, how do I eat it in a worthy manner? When you eat, there, there, there's three different actions that, that should be happening at the same time. Obviously, the first one is the physical act of eating. I don't need to explain that. Uh, the, the second is, is the mental act of remembering. The word, the, the table says, do this in remembrance of me. We're called to remember. So when we do this, he says, don't let your mind be in neutral here. Don't go through the motions. Think on and remember what this bread stands for, what this cup represents. Remember those historical truths that Jesus Christ is the Son of God whose body was torn on the cross for you, whose blood was shed to cover your sins and reconcile you to God. Remember those things. Remember that he's coming again. And so there's this mental action we're called to do of remembering. 
I, I think very often, though, that's where we stop and we miss the third most important action. Uh, because, you know what, an unbeliever, someone who has no regard for Jesus Christ, can come and they can eat and they can remember. The devil himself, if he were to join us at this table, could eat and could remember, recognize what Jesus had done. Uh, So remembering is not the key here. It's essential, but but it's not the key. There's another action that Paul says that we have to engage in when we do the Lord's Supper, and that's a spiritual action. 1 Corinthians 11, 28 to 29, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. So here's a command. When you come, you need to examine yourselves. And what are you to examine yourself on? Are you rightly discerning the body of Christ? Are you rightly discerning the body of Christ. Now that term there, body of Christ, kind of has a double meaning. Maybe you've already figured that out. You use it in two senses. It, it, it means obviously the physical body of Christ. When Jesus says, hey, this represents my body. My body was broken for you. So the body of Christ obviously is Jesus' physical body. But, but that's not what he means in this sense. When he says, discern the body of Christ When he says discern the body of Christ, he's talking about the fellowship of believers. The people that Jesus died for and won through the breaking of his body. We are the body of Christ. And so when we think of the physical body of Christ, we're reminded of Jesus' attitude of loving self-sacrifice for others. Jesus laid down his, the perfect one, the sinless one, the one who never offended but was offended. He laid down his life for you and for me. This is the gospel. This is what we're called to remember, that attitude of Jesus of loving self-sacrifice for others, even for those who didn't merit it. He died for the person um, next to you. Look to the person to your left. I'm serious. Look to the person to your left. (laughs) Okay. Jesus, when you eat the cup, when we eat the cup together in one action, what we're saying is, this isn't just me. Jesus died for you. Right? Jesus had this attitude towards you of loving self-sacrifice. Okay, now turn to your right. You guys aren't very obedient, I'll be honest. (laughs) Saying Jesus died for you. Jesus had an attitude of loving self-sacrifice for you so that we could be one, that he would make one new people out of all the peoples of the earth bound together into a new family, the family of God. That's why we eat together as one. That's why we eat one loaf. Jesus in his final prayer to, uh, before he um, goes to the cross, these last words to his father and some of the very last words he prays in that prayer, John chapter 17, he says in verse 23, I have given them, he's talking about the church, I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. How, how will the world know? Jesus says that, that the cross is real, that Jesus is the Son of God. How How will the world know? When they see that there's this radical unity, this radical loving and honoring 
amongst the people that call themselves followers of Jesus Christ. That unity of the body is a powerful validation of the gospel of Jesus, he's saying. And you see this. When I was in Macedonia a few years ago, Macedonia is a country strife with division. Two-thirds of the country is ethnically Macedonian. They're Orthodox. They're like this. The other third is Albanian. They're historically Muslim. They're like this. They hate one another. I lived on the dividing line. That's the Albanian part of town. That's the Macedonian part of town. That's where Albanians go to shop. That's where Macedonians go to shop. You really don't have friends that mix. You go to your own places. The only place where they came together that I saw hand in hand and where there was no distinction was the Church of Jesus Christ. That was a beautiful thing on Sunday mornings to go. And you see, you've got Albanian, Macedonian holding hands. One, no hostility. Love towards one another. And in that place, that's, that, that's a powerful validation of the cross of Jesus Christ. And, and, and so when we take communion, it's not just about you. It's about us. This is why we do it together. This is why you, you can't really do it alone in front of your TV screen. I don't know how people who don't go to church, who do church with Joel Olstein, I, I don't know how they take communion. I don't know how you do this. How do you have the Lord's Supper? You can't have the Lord's Supper on your own because that's not what it is. It says when you come together, you eat together because in eating, it, it, there's a symbolic act of oneness. Jesus died to make us one. You can't really do that in front of your TV screens. It can only be done with one another. So just as baptism is a sign of our union with Christ, the Lord's Supper is a sign of our union with one another in his church. And, and this is where the Corinthians, I guess, were just falling short. They were, they were doing a, what you could call a bad job. They were eating in an unworthy manner. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 11, verses 20, it says, So then when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat. Come on, guys. It's not the Lord's Supper, he says. Literally, it means when you come together, it's impossible to eat the Lord's Supper. Your very act of doing it is negating everything it's about. It's not the Lord's Supper. Why? Well, he tells us in verse 21 and, and verse 22, for when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one person uh, go, remains hungry, another one gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat in and drink? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? In other words, the situation they faced is um, those who uh, were masters, those who were rich, who didn't have to work till nine at night, they got off early. They got there early and they just started eating the food. And by the time the slaves and the poor people in the church, by the time their shifts were over and they got there, the food was gone. The people were drunk. They ate it without any regard for the other people. And in doing that, they displayed a total lack of unity, disregard for the body of Christ, no discernment for one another. They were divided into factions. They were not loving one another. The opposite of everything the body of Christ and the blood of Christ represented at the Lord's Supper. So Paul says they were guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. I don't want to sin against the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. I... I'm a father. I've got a few children, and I don't think Annika's here. Is Annika gone? Erica, is Annika gone? Okay. So, um, my kids occasionally don't show love to one another. Have you ever? And often it's kind of directed one way in that relationship because there's a strong one, and then there's a sensitive one, and. And the one's kind of sometimes overly sensitive and the other one's a little overly bullish. And so feelings kind of get hurt. But I'll have, it's not uncommon for, for Annika to, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be observing. 
She, she really wronged Britta some way. She hurt Britta's feelings. She wasn't loving. And uh, I didn't like what I saw. And then she'll, she'll want to come and love on Daddy. Right? Because she loves to cuddle with her dad. And she would crawl up into my lap. Oh, Daddy, I love you so much. And, 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 and what do I do? I'm not taking your love. You got to go give love to that person. Don't think that you cannot love my other daughter. And you can come and crawl up on daddy's love and go, oh, I love you, daddy. No, 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 no. Hey, I'd love to do this with you. But I think what you need to go is you need to go back there and you need to love on her. Okay, when I see that, then you can come love on daddy. You can't love the father and not love his children. Isn't that right? You know that as a parent. And so they were guilty in the way they treated one another. They were guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, you know, so, so maybe it means more than, than just this to take it in a worthy manner, but certainly, certainly one of the important uh, ways in which we take it in, in a worthy manner is by making sure that we are living in loving unity as much as possible in our relationships with one another. To take it in a worthy manner means that, that you are embracing what it represents in your attitude and the way you are living, that you are loving your fellow believers, that you are striving for unity, that you are forgiving, and you are seeking forgiveness. And if you find you are lacking, then you go and you deal with that lack so that you can come and crawl up on the Father's lap at the Lord's table and say, I love you. I love your blood. I love your body given for me. And, and, and then the Lord goes, I know you do. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go, go and reconcile to that person and then come back to the Lord and then come back to the altar. Right? Same idea. The Gospel of uh, John, his account of the Last Supper is a little bit different than the other three. He gives a, a different conversation. And it's at that Last Supper Jesus had with his disciples. He, he, he turned to them and he said, a new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you are to love one another. This is what Jesus says, right, you know, as he's breaking the bread and as he's passing the cup. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you are to love one another. And that's not easy. That sort of love does not come easy. That sort of love is costly love, but it's the love that God had for us in Jesus, and it's the love that we are commanded to offer to one another. And what Paul says is, if you don't, it could be hazardous to your health. Eat in a worth, to eat in a worthy way it requires spiritual action that we would examine our hearts. Are we striving for oneness with our brothers and sisters in the Lord? Are, do we have the same attitude of mind as Jesus Christ did when he laid down himself for the interests of the other? Next Sunday we take communion together. Uh, and we're also going to have a meal afterwards, which is great. So we're going to kind of enact what Christians for 2,000 years have been doing. Coming to that table in that symbolic meal and then having a real meal together with one another. We're going to do that next Sunday. So I wanted to preach about it this Sunday to give us time to take this to heart. Okay. And so let, let, let's, let's do what we're commanded to do when Paul says everyone ought to examine their selves before, the, before they would eat and drink 
together. So this is what I I invite you to do. Examine yourself. Is there any action you need to take this week to set anything right with your brother and sister in the Lord? Is there some love you've been withholding that you need to give? Is there some unforgiveness that you need to forgive? Is there some bitterness in your heart heart that you're harboring that you need to surrender to God say this isn't right help me be free of this examine yourselves this week so that when we come together next Sunday and eat the Lord's Supper together we can truly in a united way physically mentally and spiritually showcase the preciousness of the blood of Jesus by how we are loving and serving one another. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have loved us the the way you have in Jesus. While we were sinners, you sent your son into the world to die for us. That's incredible. We thank you, Father, that uh, in Jesus we are reconciled to you. Nothing stands between us. There is no dividing wall. Lord, we're reminded again that um, the gospel of Jesus isn't just about uniting us to you, it's about uniting us to one another. That we might offer to one another the same love that you have offered to us in Jesus Christ. And Lord, I I know that that's very often difficult. Um, But it's something that you require of us and by the power of the Holy Spirit that you've placed within us that, that that, that we can give to one another. So, Lord, we want to honor you in the way that we would uh, come to to this table together next Sunday and we would, uh, as one people, as we would eat and we would drink together. So I just pray that 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 oneness that takes place next Sunday would would go just beyond the physical act, would go beyond the mental act, but would really be a spiritual act of unity amongst us. For the glory of the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. Amen. I invite you to stand with me and we'll close with a song which I think kind of um, sums up